Nadia Rubai. I am one of the co-directors of Binghamton University's Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocities Prevention. Uh, and I'm really excited um, that you are here with us uh, this evening. For those of you who don't know about the Institute, um, it is a relatively new initiative at Binghamton University that includes developing a new academic program, um, bringing in practitioners and residents, um, such as uh, we have this evening, an annual conference, a series of research projects, a lot of engagement, and our mission is to bridge traditional divides uh, between different disciplines, between the academic and the practitioner communities, um, and between government, civil society, and the private sector at all levels and in all parts of the world toward the goal of preventing future atrocities and genocide. As you all know, if you have any knowledge of the, the Holocaust, which we're going to learn much more about today um, from, a, from a musical perspective, you know that the entire world expressed the sentiment of never again following the Holocaust, and yet we have seen again and again mass atrocities and other genocides. And so we have a lot of work to do, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity for us to contribute to prevention. The Practitioners in Residence Program at IDMAP is one of our exciting initiatives, um, one of our signature programs where we bring to campus people who work in the field of prevention in a variety of ways, and they spend a week with us. And they speak with classes, talk directly with students, meet with faculty, talk about other opportunities to collaborate, uh, and they have at least one public presentation as part of that. We're very honored that tonight um, we have with us Tamara Rep Freeman, Dr. Tamara Rep Freeman, um, and that we have the opportunity to host her here in the University Art Museum, um, a beautiful location, and I think has lovely acoustics that will that will serve us well this evening. And so I want to thank Diane Butler for being willing to uh, cooperate with us and collaborate with us on, on this particular evening. Um, we do have. Um, outside uh, of the museum, uh, some refreshments for a little reception afterwards so that we can continue conversations um, after this event. Um, and there also is a sign-up sheet on the back desk if you'd like to be kept informed of future events of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. You can sign up there and we can keep you on the in and on the mailing list. Um, we have an additional six um, practitioners and residents this um, semester, so we'll have a very busy semester, so if you'd like to be kept informed of that, um, please do sign up. Um, I am not going to give a long introduction to Dr. Tamara Rep Freeman. You have in the program a uh, biography of, of her work. Um, I just want to share with you on a more personal level how engaging and rewarding um, and enlightening it has already been having Thanks. conversations with her and listening to her have conversations with others, faculty and students, um, in, in the week that she has been here. Um, and I am, have been looking forward to this evening um, for, for some time now, um, and I know she's going to open our minds and our hearts um, and get us thinking about things in a very different way and, and move us um, emotionally um, in, a, in a very powerful way. Um, so her presentation, her, her time here today with us to, um, is titled Holocaust Songs of Hope and Spiritual Resistance, <coughs> The Music and Stories of Ghetto and Labyrinth Prisoners. And I think we are all going to learn a great deal. I'm really thankful that you're here. Tamara? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rubai. Thank you. Welcome everyone, and Dr. Rabai, thank you for that lovely introduction. It's been an honor to be a practitioner in residence this week with the Institute of Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. Thank you so much. And greetings to all of you. The slide in front of you is an archival drawing from the Terezin concentration camp. It takes place in an attic, people are making music together secretly because to be discovered would be punishable by death. 
The artwork is unsigned because to document the atrocities of the Nazis would bring penalty of, of death to the artist. But notice how the artist has used so much black in that drawing. Survivors that I've spoken with have told me what it has been like to make music in hiding in a terezine attic. As I talk about the music of the Jewish people in the ghettos and the concentration camps, I want you all to know that I'm thinking of the other populations of people who were persecuted during the Holocaust. I'm thinking of political prisoners and social democrats and socialists and communists. I'm thinking of Jehovah's Witnesses and homosexuals and the Roma and Sinti people, the mentally and physically disabled people. It just so happens that the Jewish people recorded their musical tradition in the ghettos and concentration camps orally by singing to one another and also by notating the music on scraps of paper. The songs were collected immediately following the war by a Polish poet and composer named Szmerka Kaczyzinski. He interviewed survivors in displaced persons camps and recorded their songs and published a book called Lieder von die Ghettos und Lagen, Songs from the Ghettos and Concentration Camps. There are only few copies left of this book in the world, and I'm so privileged to have two of those copies in my private library. So the songs that I will be playing for you this afternoon, most of them come from this archival book. Let me tell you about my viola. This viola was made for a Hungarian Jewish woman named Talba Butzel, who moved from Hungary to Germany to create a, a career in teaching music and performing on her viola. The only challenge for her was to get someone to make her a viola that would fit her tiny stature and tiny fingers. So she went to a luthier named Josef Bausch, and he custom made this instrument for her in 1935. During the Holocaust, Taube Butzel was living in this apartment building in Berlin. The address was 9 Wrangelstrasse, Wrangel Street, in Berlin, Germany. In September of 1942, the Nazis came pounding on her door, took her away, and left all her possessions behind, planning to come back to loot her apartment and steal all of her valuables. A righteous Gentile neighbor went into her apartment, risking his own life to rescue this instrument. He hoped that she would return from the Holocaust, but she did not. So he secretly shipped Tauba Butzel's precious instrument to Senta Butzel, Tauba's sister, who happened to be living close to where I live in northern New Jersey. I'm now the fifth owner of the instrument. In Berlin and across Germany, you see memorial plaques embedded in front of doors of people's homes, and they are called a Stolperstein, literally a stumbling block. And so here is the, the stumbling block, the Stolperstein, the Taube Butzel, and it says that she perished on the 13th day of September, 1942, in Theresienstadt, the concentration camp um, near Prague, Czechoslovakia. Let's now explore the music of hope and spiritual resistance of the Jewish people as the years were leading up to the war.
The first song I'd like to share with you is called Das Einholt Front Lied, the United Front Song. The photo is of Ernst Busch, the first singer of this song. The Austrian composer Hans Eisler created the melody to Das Einheit Front Lied, the United Front Song, in 1936 as a result of a direct request by the popular playwright Bertolt Brecht. Brecht had emphasized the need for a powerful song to be sung at the Popular Front Congress taking place in London. The Popular Front Congress was made up of communists, leftists, and centrists, all working to resist fascism. Eisler said, and I quote, Bertolt Brecht phoned me and said the unity of the workers was important and a song must be written about this. The next day, already Ernst Busch was singing it in English. Das Einheit Front Lied was first sung in 1936 by Ernst Busch, a German anti-fascist singer. The song became popular through Busch's 1938 recording of Six Songs of Democracy. The recording was made under fire during the Spanish Civil War. And the text is, because a man is human, he really needs a little bite to eat. He won't get full on idle talk. He needs his bread and meat. And then it says in German, Drum links zwei, drei. Drum links zwei, drei. So left, two, three. So left, two, three. For your place is here, my friend. March along in the workers' united front. You're a worker united until the end. Another of Ernst Busch's six songs of democracy was Die Moor Soldaten, the Peatbog Soldiers. The melody of Die Moor Soldaten was composed by Rudi Goguel, a factory worker. He joined the German Communist Party, which resulted in his arrest in 1932 and then being sent to the Borgamore concentration camp. Borgamore was located in the swampy, northwest corner of Germany, near the Dutch, Dutch frontier. The prisoners sang Die Moor Soldaten while they drained the swamps. In August 1933, a cabaret was staged that featured 16 prisoners marching on a stage with spades on their so shoulders, singing Die Moor Soldaten. Goguel himself conducted using a broken spade handle. De Moor Soldaten was smuggled to other camps and was published in exile newspapers. All that is left 
of the concentration camp is the ornate archival sheet music that you see, a memorial plaque, and a stone etched with the first verse of the song in its original German. Far and wide as the eye can wander, heath and bog are everywhere. Not a bird sings out to cheer us. Oaks are standing gaunt and bare. We are the peat bog soldiers. We're marching with our spades to the bog. Unser Mut wird nicht gebrochen, our courage is unbroken. Joshua Israel Sendorf, who was pictured on the slide, wrote the lyrics for Unser Mut wird nicht gebrochen, our courage is unbroken. Sendorf was born in Wojsk, Poland in 1902. He became a rabbi but soon turned his attention to anti-fascist politics. He was pursued by the Polish secret police, so he fled to France. Upon the German occupation of France in November 1942, Sendorf was deported to the Pithivier detention camp in southern France, which is pictured in front of you. As a result, his Yiddish poem Unser Mut wird nicht gebrochen, became Le Chant de Pithivier, the Song of Pithivier. It became the anthem of the camp's inmates who ultimately perished in Auschwitz. Unser Mut wird nicht gebrochen, in French, Tout uni avec courage, in English. Our courage is unbroken, for we listen to life's call. Victory will soon be spoken. We will triumph over all.
The next songs are from Vilna, the so-called Jerusalem of Lithuania. Even during the Holocaust, Vilna was the Jerusalem of the Jewish people in Lithuania. Choirs and orchestras, theaters, cabarets, houses of study and worship continued to thrive in spite of all the atrocities. Our next song was written by Leib Rosenthal, Nur leben ewig, we live forever. Leib Rosenthal was the oldest child in a highly cultured Vilna Jewish family. His younger sister Chayla was a talented singer and actress and was to find her first success performing her brother's compositions. Leib Rosenthal was a poet and he published his first book of poetry at the age of 14. In the Vilna ghetto, he became one of the most successful writers of musicals and theater reviews. In addition to his work for the theater, he wrote many independent songs, both for his sister and for other singers in the ghetto. For historians, Leib Rosenthal's songs shed light on the harsh realities of daily ghetto life. When the final liquidation of the Vilna ghetto took place in 1943, Leib Rosenthal was sent to the Estonian concentra concentration camp, Kloga. He died there in January 1945, forcibly drowned in the Baltic Sea. He wrote, Mir leben ewig, es brennt a Welt. We live forever, even while the world's ablaze. We live forever through these awful days, despite the efforts of our enemies who want to bring us cringing to our knees. We live forever. During the Holocaust, children had to have hope and resiliency and spiritual resistance too. And quite often, their roles in the family were to be the adults and the saviors. The next song chronicles the truth of children in ghettos. The song is called Yisrolik. Yisrolik is a very charming play on the Hebrew word Yisrael, which means Israel. A Yisraelic was a brave child who helped his or her family by smuggling food and medicine into the ghetto. Leib Rosenthal also wrote the lyrics to Yisraelic, which were set to the melody of Misha Wechsler, a prolific composer for cabarets staged in the Vilna Ghetto. Wechsler was also the conductor of the Vilna Ghetto Theater Orchestra. Wechsler's best-known song was Yisrolik, which describes the courage of a young child living by his wits in the ghetto. The song made a star of its singer, Chayla Rosenthal, Leib's sister, who I've mentioned several times before. Wechsler's music and Leib Rosenthal's lyrics combined to make a song 
that is both cynical and charming and is still popular in Yiddish theater today. The lyrics of Yisrolik. The little child says, so buy my cigarettes, buy some saccharin. Today, my wares have become very cheap, a life for a cent, a penny is my earning. You've heard of ghetto business people. My name is Yisrolik. I'm a child of the ghetto, a stray young child. And although I've netted nothing, I can still serve up a whistle and a song. This cattle car is from Whitwell, Tennessee, and is part of the Paper Clips project. The students in middle school about 10 years ago collected over 6 million paper clips to symbolize the 6 million Jewish people who were lost, plus many, many more. And we see this cattle car because this is the setting of the next piece. Anima Min was composed by David Azriel Fashtag, a brilliant singer in the Warsaw Ghetto. The text is taken from the 13 Articles of Faith written by the medieval rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, known by the acronym Rambam. The song is believed to have been composed in a cattle car destined for Treblinka. Fashtag sang his anima amin to soothe and encourage his fellow human cargo. Soon the other people were comforted and sang along with him in the cattle car. Two people escaped from that cattle car. One was shot immediately and died. The other one made his way to the United States. And so this song spread through the United States even faster after it was composed than Europe. People sang Anima Amin as they walked toward the concentration camp showers, which were tragically gas chambers. And survivors have told me that they sang Anima Amin during death marches. The words are in Hebrew. Ani ma'amin be'emuna shlema. I believe, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Moshiach, of the Messiah. I believe that even though he may delay, although he may tarry, I still believe.
This is a picture of Schmerta Tashashinsky, a partisan who survived the war, visited um, survivors in displaced persons camps, and recorded their songs. And so he was the editor of the first book that I showed you, that picture called Lieder von die Ghettos in Lagen. There he is, that Schmerke Kaczynski. He was a beloved and prolific poet and composer in his own right, and he wrote the lyrics to the Partisaner March, the March of the Partisan Soldiers. The music was composed by Halper Levik, who was a famous Yiddish playwright. Together they created an anthem that emboldened the Jewish resistance fighters. Despite minimal support and anti-Semitic hostility from the surrounding populations, thousands of Jews battled the Germans in Eastern Europe. Resistance units emerged in over 100 ghettos in Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. Thousands of Jews escaped from the ghettos and joined partisan units in nearby forests. The survival rates of the partisans was 1%. The Vilna ghetto partisans called themselves the Farenikta Partizana Organizatsie, the FPO, the United Partisan Organization. The road is hard, we know. The war is not easy, this is not play. A person's life lies in battle. Freedom is our great goal. Hey, F-P-O, we are here, courageous and bold to the battle. Even today, the partisans are going to battle the enemy, to fight the war for the workers' power. It's one of the most emblematic and important songs of the Holocaust. It's considered the national anthem of Holocaust victims and survivors. Never say that you are walking the final road is also known as the partisan song. It was written by the young Vilna poet Hirsch Glick and is based on a pre-existing melody by the Soviet Jewish composers and brothers Dmitri and Daniel, Daniel Pokras. Inspired by the news of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the song was adopted as the official anthem of the Vilna partisans shortly after it was composed in 1943 and spread with remarkable rapidity to other ghettos and camps. The song is powerful and defiantly optimistic, acknowledging suffering in the past and present, but urging people to continue fighting for their survival. It is one of the most frequently performed songs at Holocaust commemoration ceremonies. Please turn in your program to the second page where you will see the music. 
and I'm going to teach you all how to sing it. First, I'd like to sing it for you. It is written in Yiddish, and uh, Yiddish is a combination of basically German and Hebrew and Slavic languages. Zognit came molas du kestem letzten beg, hosh himlen bleien erfarstellen bleier teg, kum in bet noch unser eus gepenkte schau, svet abheugt on unser trot wir seinen go. Kom in bed nog onzer oes gepenkte show. Svet abweikt on onzer trot meer zijn in go. Please repeat after me. Zog nit keen mol. Als du geest. Dem letzten weg. There's a lot of consonants in Yiddish, right? Plenty of them. Hosh himlen. That was very good. Blayane. Farstellen. Bloy ateg. You're doing beautifully. Now the next phrase is actually repeated. So when you learn this next phrase, you'll, you'll know the third and final phrase. Kumen vet. Noch unser. Ois gebenk te sho. Your pronunciation is beautiful. Svet a poik ton unzo trot mir sein in do. Ready, begin. Svet a poik ton unzo trot mir sein in do. Let's finish the song. Ku men vet noch unzo ois gebenk to show svet a poik ton unzo trot mir sein do. Congratulations, your Yiddish is outstanding. So I'm going to sing a phrase and I'd like you to sing it back to me. Zog nit kein mol as du geist dem letzen weg. Here's your first note. Zog nit kein mol as du geist dem letzten weg. Hosh himlen bleien, verstellen bleiertek. Here's your first note. Hosh himlen bleien, verstellen bleiertek. You're doing beautifully. Kum in bet noch unser Eus gebenk to show. Here's your first note. Kum in bet noch unser Eus gebenk to show. Here's the next phrase. Svet ab poik ton unser trot. Mir sein in do. Here's your first note. Svet apoik ton unser trot. Mir sein in do. We're almost done. Kum in vet noch unser eus gebenk. To show. Let's try that again. Kum in vet noch unser eus gebenk. To show. I bet you can finish it with me. Svet apoik. That was excellent. So survivors have very carefully instructed me that when the song is played or heard or sung, out of respect, the audience should stand if they're able. So with your kind indulgence, please stand and let's sing it together. And I will play and sing at the same time. Okay. And here's a little introduction for you.
beautiful. Please be seated. That was excellent. Another beloved poet and composer from Poland. A monument of Mordechai Gebertik is placed lovingly in Krakow, where he was born. Mordechai Gebertik was a preeminent folk artist in Yiddish theater and song. It is amazing how this most beloved poet and composer was self-taught in music. He figured out melodies on a shepherd's flute that he carried in his pocket and by tapping out tunes on the piano with just one finger. Minuten von Betochen, moments of confidence, expressed Gebertig's encouragement to his fellow Jews to be strong, have hope, and fight back. My Jewish friends, be happy. It won't be long, I hope. The war will soon end. The enemy's end is near. Please be happy. Please don't worry. Have patience and faith and take everything for love. Composer Erich Hugo Frost reminds us that many, many millions of non-Jewish populations of people were persecuted and murdered by the Nazis, to include the Jehovah's Witnesses. Composer Erich Hugo Frost was a Jehovah's Witness. In April 1933, the National Socialists banned the Watchtower Society, which resulted in Frost being set, sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. The witnesses were promised their freedom if they renounced their religion, but they refused and remained in the concentration camp. Erich Hugo Frost wrote, Jehovah's Witnesses undeterred. The struggle is fierce. The battle rages wild. The fetters, too, are binding. The chains are heavy, but mighty the arm which shields you. Jehovah's Witnesses in enemy land and far from the homeland, exiled from loved ones. Lift up your gazes to him, to God whose hand is already extended to you. Thank you. 
The Dachau Lied, the song from Dachau, was created by two men who were working next to each other like horses pulling carts of boulders in the brutal Dachau, Germany concentration camp. Lyricist Jura Seufer and Austrian composer and conductor Herbert Zipper decided to create a song that would embolden the prisoners to stay strong in body and mind. The result was a march filled with unexpected rhythms, key changes, unusual challenging notes. All of these forced the prisoners to keep their minds sharp. Herbert Zipper also staged clandestine concerts in an abandoned latrine, composing music and conducting a small instrumental ensemble of instruments that were smuggled into the camp or made by Zipper himself out of bits of wood. Here is an archival drawing from Dachau. Jura Seufer wrote in German, Stacheldraht mit Tod geladen ist um unser Welt gespannt. Sharp barbed wire with death is laden, our world it does surround, and the heaven without mercy, frost and burning sun sends down. Far from us are all our joys, and far our homeland far our wives. As we march to work in silence, thousands fearing for their lives. But we've all learned the lesson of Dachau by now, and hard as steel we won't bend. Be a man, camarade. Stay humane, camarade. Do all your work. Seize it now, camarade. Then Arbeit, Arbeit mach frei, for work frees us in the end. As prisoners were transferred from camp to camp, they took lyrics with them. And so a second Dachau lead was composed. In 1940, in the French internment camp at Damigny, a second setting of Seufer's lyrics was composed for chorus and piano by Marcel Rubin a fellow prisoner had memorized Seufer's words and brought them to Rubin's attention. So here is a second Dachau lead.
We now see a photo of the Buchenwald concentration camp orchestra. All of the large camps had orchestras. They played to deceive human cargo descending from cattle cars. The orchestras accompanied workers leaving and returning to the concentration camps. The orchestras played to announce public hangings and executions. The orchestras played at night to entertain the Nazis in nightclubs. The Buchenwald song, whose true authorship in the camp was concealed for fear of reprisals by the SS, was still widely circulated. It was sung in other camps and was even broadcast on foreign radio stations. Fritz Beda Lohner, the lyricist, was a well-known popular song lyricist, librettist, and satirist for the thriving world of the Viennese cabaret in the post-World War I years. He is best known as the librettist for Franz Lehár's operettas. Composer Hermann Leopoldi said that this revolutionary song went right over the naive heads of the Nazis. A Buchenwald prisoner said, quote, when we sang the Buchenwald lead, we always put all our hatred and conviction into it. Buchenwald, I will never be able to forget you. You are my destiny. Whoever gets away will understand forever how wonderful it is to be free. When I was able to purchase this viola, which, has, which was rescued from the Holocaust, I felt a deep sense of responsibility to cherish not just the instrument, but the memory of the woman for whom the instrument was made, Tauba Utzel, a blessed memory. And so I decided to create a piece of music in her honor, in her memory. And it is called the Nigun, which in Hebrew or Yiddish means a song without words. It's for viola solo. And it tells the story of Tauba during the war, her capture and her death, and ultimately her tears dropping from heaven.
for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, your wonderful audience. Yes. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Do we have time? That's a very good question. Um, the music has been incorporated in a lot of different movies, theater, um, all kinds of documentaries. Yes, a lot of it. One of the most popular songs um, that's been incorporated in, in the arts is a song that I did not play, um, Oifen Pripachik by The Fireplace. <laughs> That's played in Schindler's List a lot. But Zognit Kenmo, The Partisan March, um, a lot of these songs are used in, in the arts. Yes. Yes. And it just reinvents it. And so when you were doing that song, it had a particular power because it brought up so many of the themes of the, the various pieces that you performed. But it brought it into the present. It was yours. But you shared directly with us. And I wanted to thank you for that. Because it kind of did, it brought it alive in a, in a new and contemporary way, at least for me as a woman. Mm. Thank you, Professor Buchanan. So I just was asked to repeat things so, um, for, for, the, uh, for the videotape. So I believe what you're saying is that the last song that I played brought history alive and made it relevant for today. Do you remember which song that was? Oh, that I composed. Thank you. I really appreciate that acknowledgement. And um, when I composed it, I was thinking about the composers that I've studied and um, many of them the German composers. So the very first theme um, reminds me of a Lendler, a German waltz. That's why I composed it in, in three, four time. And this part here. It's right out of Bach. So I'm so glad that you that you picked up on those on those musical quotes, historical quotes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, first of all, for this incredible presentation. Um, could you tell us something about the story of how you inspired the Wiener Brass? Yes. Um, I'd be very happy to tell you the story of how I how I was able to purchase this instrument. Um, there is a Yiddish word uh, called beshert, a moment of destiny, ordained destiny. And um, let me just put this down for a second. There's a wonder, I live in northern New Jersey, and there's a wonderful bow maker named Robert Ames. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but if you loosen the tightening screw of a bow and take it out, this is horsehair. So about every six to 12 months, you get new horsehair put in your bow because it just kind of wears out. And this gentleman, Robert Ames, makes beautiful bows and repairs them. And once in a while, he'll sell a beautiful instrument on consignment. And I was on my way to Montclair State University to teach a little class, a little workshop on music of the Holocaust and I had about three bows with me, and I gave them to Mr. Ames, and I said, by the way, I'm getting a lot more gigs, a lot more concerts on the viola. I'm primar I was primarily a violinist. 
and I said, if an interesting viola comes into the shop, I'd, I'd really like to try it. And he said, something just came in. And it has papers. It has a really interesting story. And I looked at it, and I read the papers and listened to him describe what I told you. And I was just in shock. And I said, yes, I would like to try it. <laughs> and, and I did. Um, and I took it home with me, and I played it, and I fell in love with it. And I realized at that moment that it was more than an instrument to play. It was a, respons a responsibility that was being given to me to keep alive the legacy and the memory of the Holocaust, but more importantly, to teach genocide prevention through music. So that is a very important part of my career, and I use the viola to help me do that. And that's how it happened. And by the way, a dear friend of mine, um, Craig Mum, is the principal violist with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and he's much taller than I am, and he has really long fingers. And before you spend a lot of money on an instrument, you get other people to play it so you can hear how it sounds. And when he played it, it didn't sound that great because he's used to a much bigger instrument. And he said, now, Tamara, you try it. He said, yeah, that's for you. And that's how it happened. I'm curious how playing this music, practicing this music, studying this music, teaching it, affects you emotionally because it, you, you talked about at the very beginning how you, as you're playing, you're thinking of the people who wrote the music, the people who performed it, the people who sang it um, and suffered while the, the music was being played and were enlivened by it. How, how do you handle the, the, the freight of those emotions when you're dealing with this so frequently? Um, that's a wonderful question. The question was, how do I deal emotionally with the power of this music and all of the, um, the psychological underpinnings of the music? And I will tell you honestly, it is very, very hard because I interviewed a lot of survivors and they sang a lot of this music to me, so I'm hearing their voices while I play it. And to keep my composure, I just have to concentrate so hard. I just have to look at every single note and make every note count. I, I work on it very, very hard. And it, it's, I do take it very, very seriously. And that's how I approach all the music I play, including orchestral music. But this music, you're right, is very, very different. And I'm trying to get the, the notes to say something. I don't just want them to sound good or correct. I want them to actually express something. So I use every ounce of energy I have emotionally and physically, and I think about my best teachers while I play. And I remember the, the pedagogy that they taught me to help express everything that needs to come out. But it's not easy. It does take a lot of strength. Yes. Um, no, um, that's that's a question that comes up a lot. Are any of of the pieces that I played right now online? Some of them um, are in my website, HolocaustMusic.org. People ask me to make CDs a lot, so that's on my checklist of things that I need to accomplish. But a lot of these songs are on other websites, such as the website for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. So if you Google that museum and look for Feststedt, Stand Fast, you will hear Erich Hugo Frost singing it with the men's, the men's choir from the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's an archival recording. You will actually hear him singing it with the other witnesses. And it's a very powerful thing. Yes? How far into the composition or you say into the, the process of the this work that you can do, did you come across the, 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 the,
how far along? Right. So you're asking about the timing of my researching the music and getting the viola, purchasing the viola. Um, I, was a, I was able to purchase the viola just within about a year or two after my journey of researching this music. And at the same time, I was playing recitals for Cafe Europa, a friendship society of Holocaust survivors. And there was one survivor in particular who was... He called me his patron, my patron. He, he would give me little kniplach, little bits of money to um, pay for my college education at Rutgers for my doctorate and to help me buy music. And so when I was composing the piece for Tabu Butzel, it was right after I met him. And he inspired me also to compose this piece. So things happened in a rather quick succession. succession. So that served as a sign for me that I needed to keep going. And I retired from my position as a music teacher in the Ridgewood schools. I retired after only 30 years because I knew that there were so many other wonderful music teachers waiting to teach beautiful students in a public school district, but I'm the only person in the country who is not just playing the music, but writing curriculum and teaching teachers how to teach it. So I felt it was my calling. But it happened in very quick succession. Can you talk a little bit more about how you use this music or how you instruct others in the use of this music for prevention? Um, I know you're doing that in, in other sessions that you had on Tuesday evening, which you're doing tomorrow, but to share with us a little bit about how this is used forward right that that's such an important question because I do try to use this music for genocide prevention initiatives and I find that um, when students are learning the history of Holocaust and genocide they take the the subject very seriously but when you bring the arts and when you bring music in, it brings in another layer of meaning and emotion. People get to know the, um, the victims of genocide in a very personal way. And by doing that, it's helping them to better identify, identify with the struggles and the humiliation of persecution and marginalization. And to use an educational term, it's a hook. It's a way of drawing the students into the very vulnerable state of, of humanness that we all have. And a lot of the melodic material and certainly the lyrics are, are universal in theme. And I have students study the music, play the music, um, perform the music, and journal about the music. They then write their own lyrics based upon their own woundedness, whether it's from bullying or from persecution in their own family of origin. And by doing that, by putting themselves into the other's shoes, they then own the responsibility of genocide prevention. That is my premise. That is my hope. And um, I hope and I believe it just, just might be working because students from all different cultures tell me how much the music meant to them, how proud they were uh, to be part of it, how proud they were to learn it and to perform it and to share it with other people. Yes? Just one other question. It's too personal, right? No, that's quite all right. Sure. Um, my family of origin is from Russia, Lithuania, and Poland. Um, the borders kept changing, so... <laughs> um, but my, um, my Polish family suffered during the Holocaust, and my grandfather, um, Samuel Reps, 
was the youngest of 10 children, and he came to the United States with his parents as a baby, but his older siblings stayed behind in Frumpel, Poland. That is the town upon which Isaac the Sheva Singer has written all of his charming stories and plays. Um, but his older brothers and sisters stayed behind. They already had um, spouses and families and jobs, and so they stayed, and they were all lost. And when I was 10 years old, it occurred to me, it dawned on me to ask my grandfather, Poppy, where are all of your brothers and sisters? And he said they were taken out of their homes and shot in front of their homes. And I said, please tell me more. And he said, no. And when you're 10 years old and you hear a story like that, uh, it certainly sparks curiosity. My other grandfather from Russia ran zigzag across the border into Poland and was shot at and kicked in the head by the horse of a Cossack and somehow survived a dent in his skull. He always had a dent in his skull. And his stories were very graphic. And even as a child, my, my family told me these stories. Um, I did not tell my children the stories. I waited until they were much older. But my family told me. And that's, that's my, my, my family of origin, pretty much. And by the way, um, if I can brag just a little bit, my mother is one of the first women to graduate from Hebrew Union College School of Sacred Music. She's one of the first female cantors in the world. So I grew up hearing a beautiful voice. And when I was in utero, I was going to, uh, <laughs> to opera rehearsals. So I was very blessed in that way to have a lot of music in my life. So that's a beautiful part of my family history. Well, you've been a wonderful audience, and I thank you so much for your kind attention and your very um, important and insightful questions. And now the concert is over, and it is time to eat and drink. <laughs> thank you all so much.